If you notice, whether it's your dad wanting to be right or your mom seeming to be controlling or whatever, in the beginning when the mind is just starting to be aware of these ego defense mechanisms, it's for years it's it's like it's kind of kept it down. In a metaphorical sense, it's it's like they're unconscious, a lot of them. Now, when you start reading the Course, everything starts getting raised up. All these devious mm -hmm. schemes and maneuvers and games are like right up there. Mm -hmm. But the mind still is not invested in the ego, and so it, it, sees the, it sees the defenses in others. And Jesus says, whenever you feel angry or frustrated at a brother for using a particular defense, you could say for being controlling or mm -hmm. whatever it is, you're still failing to forgive yourself for the very same attempt. In other words, if, if I still believe that the defense has a reality, and first I'm seeing it out there, and then I'm saying like, then I start to pull it back to my mind, and I start to say, I'm controlling, I have to be right, the guilt from, from transferring it from one seeming person body to another seeming person body is enormous, because all it is is now I'm going to pull it away off of this person, and it seems like the Course is saying, yeah, you, you can't keep projecting on your brother and blaming your brother. So the blame, instead of blaming them, gets <laughs> turned onto this body. Mm -hmm. And it's the same error, though. That's where we get back into mind-body. I have to really start to, to see that I am mind, mm -hmm. and that this identity that I thought was not in him, it was in me, is also a construct of my, in my mind as well. Because otherwise, the, what, what good is the transfer? Now I'm not so much angry and blaming of mm -hmm. my father or my mother, but <laughs> I walk around angry and blaming of mm -hmm. who I believe to be me. Mm -hmm. And the air gets, it's transferred, but it's not, it's not released yet. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, when you're going through these things, just think, well, this is a step. He talks about it in here, he describes it, and, and it's a phase, this too <laughs> pass. shall pass, yes. <laughs> So don't leave it with with my body. <laughs> What's the next step? I yeah. mean, I, I, there's a part of my mind that knows, but I would like to hear you talk yes. about that. Well, the next step is, for me, was it was like, of of getting more and more in touch with I am mind. I am not a body on the screen, in the world. I'm not a linear construct either. I mean, the way I've always conceived of myself as David was. Here's David's past, some of the things David's not too happy about that didn't go David's way, and so on and so forth. The, the closet of grievances, people that didn't treat David right, the ones that were special that treated David wonderful, and gosh, if the world wasn't filled with more of those, and so on and so forth. And then there's the seeming David in the present, where I could say where I where I'm at now, so to speak, in the old phrase, you know, this is where I'm at now. And then there's the the David of the future. Whether it's careers or different things we've talked about, or if I even I put it in a spiritual context, David is moving towards the atonement. Salvation lies in David's future. Instead of a career in urban planning, it's salvation. Even that is, I've had to question, because what good is future salvation? What good is future happiness? It, it seemed to be a, a helpful stepping point stepping stone to a point, and then I started reading like the immediacy of salvation section, and Jesus is saying, be not content with future happiness. Don't project the atonement into the future. You have to start bringing it back to the present. Well, in order to bring that to the present, that means I have to let go of the way I've conceived of myself and of everyone else I meet. If I conceive of persons as these linear constructs with real pasts mm -hmm. and real futures coming up, and myself as a as a linear construct with real past and real future, then how can I not how can I avoid aiming that guilt if I pull it away from others to this linear construct of myself? Mm -hmm. The shift has been more and more to start to see that mind is not in a linear construct. The the right mind is is in the present. Mm -hmm. It's not the right mind doesn't have a past and it doesn't have a future. It's a it's like a pinnacle or the top of a mountain, if you can get to the top, the view is spectacular. Because you can look at all the little, the little roads below and all the little lines and everything, and even that you seem to take and that others seem to be taking, and it's, it's all from that point, it's all just seen as, 
is a false thing. So uh, as we get into this more and more, one of the sections I want to get into eventually is the immediacy of salvation and the section right before that that talks about cause and effect being one, being the same as a part. And we're going to go into this deeper and deeper to get to the metaphysics, but that's kind of a little synopsis of, of how it's it's gone for me, where I've, I've come back to, I'm a point mm -hmm. and not a line. Mm -hmm. That's a simple way for me to remember that. Whenever I start to feel guilty about mm -hmm. what's coming up, or or I feel, feel or worried about that, or I feel guilty about something that I, loose ends that I didn't tie up, or a bad mm -hmm. relationship I have with such and such, I just come back to, mm -hmm. I'm a point, That's not a line. One of the things I'm realizing that I forgot was that I was trying to bring truth to the illusion instead of illusion to truth. Yeah. And just seeing my oneness with God and how everything pales beside that. Yeah. When I get into thinking that I'm anything else or that I have anything else. Thanks. So we were on Lesson 135 and we were just starting to look at, at what it is you defend, which is the body. <laughs> Paragraph 4, Sentence 4. What but the body has such frailty that constant care and watchful deep concern are needful to protect its little life? What but the body falters and must fail to serve the Son of God as worthy host? Yet, it is not the body that can fear, nor be a thing of fear. It has no needs but those which you assign to it. It needs no complicated health structures of defense, no health-inducing medicine, no care, and no concern at all. Now that's quite a, obviously a huge different yeah. view than the world, but you know, even ideas of a marionette or a puppet or I sometimes think of it as like, like just a learning device, kind of like a pen or a pencil. <laughs> I mean, I have to, in my mind, equate it with something to kind of be a symbol of, of how insignificant. I mean, most you wouldn't consider putting all this care and concern and careful watching over a pencil normally. Mm -hmm. You know, a pencil, you use a pencil for what a pencil's for, writing, and then you set, lay it down. When it, you keep sharpening it as long as you need it, and then when it gets too short so that you can't hold it anymore or the lead breaks for the final time, <laughs> it's gone. I mean, it's, it's laid aside. In that sense, you know, thinking of the body like a pencil, to me, is a, is a helpful metaphor. Defend its life or give it gifts to make it beautiful, or walls to make it safe. And you but say your home is open to the thief of time, corruptible and crumbling, so unsafe it must be guarded with your very life. And we've gone into this in a number of ways. Obviously, defend its life, whether it's through security systems or mace, carrying mace or guns or um, medical things. Give it gifts to make it beautiful. That's just, we, we had that whole section on compliments and adorning the body and so on and so forth. It's really kind of making it out to be more than it really is. And Mom gave me this bracelet for my graduation and birthday, and I opened it. <laughs> and it wasn't the response that she was looking for because I looked at it and I said, Oh, Mom, you know, that's really nice. And she said, Don't you like it? I mean, don't you really like it, you know? And I said, I really do. It's, it's a wonderful symbol, you know, of, of you. And, you know, thank you. And she goes, What do you mean a symbol? <laughs> she, goes, she goes, Mary, did you show it with Steve? Did she, she wants this. For, and I, so I tried to explain, I did explain to her that, um, you know, for me, I can look at it as a symbol, but I don't want to look at it as something real adorning right now because that takes away from its purpose. And she began to understand. But um, just a little disappointed in the reaction. In that sense, it's the best use of a bracelet because it's like a, it was a starting point for, for you to just share. It, it opened kind of the conversation to go into something. In that sense, it's not evil, it's not good, it's not bad. It's, oh, the Holy Spirit can make use of everything, including bracelets on arms. <laughs> That's so neat. 
Is not this picture fearful? Fearful. <laughs> <laughs> Can you be at peace? with such a concept of your home. Yet what endowed the body with the right to serve you thus except your own belief? It is your mind which gave the body all the functions that you see in it and set its value far beyond a little pile of dust and water. Who would make defense of something that he recognized as this? You know, it's like all this fuss over a pile of dust and water. Who would make defense over it? But the key thing in there is it, it's what endowed the body with the right to serve you except your own belief, and it is your mind. So we're back to that thing again of how we don't have to blame the body. We don't have to even blame the bodies of others if they seem to be acting out, if they seem to be doing these things, defense mechanisms, so on and so forth, or they seem to be just heaping the the, in the wealth and the possessions and all these things, you know, it's like none of that matters. It's, it's my mind. What value have I assigned to the body and the world? That's the only place I have power to change is my own beliefs. As long as I try to change the figures, so to speak, in the bodies and say, whether it's abortion or anything you can think of, then it's like I've already said that there's a real threat are already saying that illusions are real and therefore you have to come up with the right way of dealing with this terrible problem or whatever mm -hmm. that's out there. The body is in need of no defense. This cannot be too often emphasized. <laughs> when Jesus says that, <laughs> he means it very literally. It will be strong and healthy if the mind does not abuse it by assigning it to roles it cannot fulfill, to purposes beyond its scope, and to exalted aims which it cannot accomplish. Such attempts, ridiculous yet deeply cherished, are the sources for the many mad attacks you make upon it, for it seems to fail your hopes, your needs, your values, and your dreams. If you believe it's your home, then of course it would make sense that I would have a lot of hopes for it, a lot of needs and values for it. You can see where the body would be more than a pile of dust if it's my home, if it's me, if it's my identity. I mean, that's the most powerful thing that, that there is, is identity, and that's why whatever the mind identifies with it will defend. If it's identified with spirit, then there's nothing to defend because spirit is invulnerable, it's, it's in a state of grace. But if I defend the body, or defend maybe my friend's body, if, if I'm identified with this being a close friend, then I would be concerned there, or family, or even then the more external things that seem to go beyond the body, the house, defensive about my house, defensive about my car, defensive about my job, or my boss, or those kind of my things, kids. my kids. Yeah, those are kind of just extensions of this body, body mm -hmm. self-concept here. Mm -hmm. The self, in quotes, that needs protection is not real. The body, valueless and hardly worth the least defense, need merely be perceived as quite apart from you, and it becomes a healthy, serviceable instrument through which the mind can operate until its usefulness is over. Who would want to keep it when its usefulness is done? Well, that sense there need merely be perceived as quite apart from you. I mean, it, I would say that to have that shift experientially comes more like I, I've described it as like the trickle and the stream and the river and the ocean. That when I first started studying the Course, you know, I'm just trying to grasp some of the ideas and, and light bulbs are going off, but it's like I'm not being used as a teacher of God yet. I'm not in the river. <laughs> I, the trickle is, is the start, and I'm grateful for the trickle because it's like this is what I've always wanted in my life. When you really start holding on to this as your only purpose and you start seeing, making that commitment to be used as a teacher of God, and 
every single situation is seen as